All right. Well, this morning <clears throat> we're continuing in uh, the Acts of the Apostles. I've already kind of given you a sketch of what we're looking at, renewed persecution, okay, the first martyr, um, God's protection because of the church's prayer, and um, God's judgments, I'd say prosecuting those who have persecuted His people. There's going to be a lot of peace in that what we're looking at this morning. But let me go ahead and start by reading the text. And let's not miss what comes at the end, and that is the progress of the gospel, the progress of the church, the things which the Lord is doing here. Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, uh, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, standing, uh, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is this angel, but Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. Now, when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to, Ces to Caesarea and was spending time there. Now, he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him. And having one over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Well, it's a long text, but again, I think all these components really fit together. So we want to take a look at each one of these uh, individually. So may the Lord bless His Word uh, to our hearing. <clears throat> Now, three weeks ago, we saw how the Lord had opened the door to the Gentiles, the door of salvation, the door to His kingdom, when He sent Peter to Cornelius. 
uh, last week, and again, there was an interlude because of illness, last week we saw him open the hearts of the Jewish believers to accept this change. Remember how difficult this must have been for the Jews because God had dealt exclusively with them for over 2,000 years. So as we understand, there's a lot of things that have to be worked through, and the church is still working through them. And one of them was, can a Gentile be saved without first becoming a Jew? The answer is yes, but that issue will come up again. Now, we also saw the establishing of the first Gentile church at Antioch, and that's very important because shortly it's going to become the epicenter of a great missionary outreach to the entire world. And we saw how the Gentile believers in Antioch were showing the love of Christ towards the believers in Jerusalem uh, when that, remember when that famine struck, and as they had shared in the spiritual blessings that the Lord had given to the Jews, to Abraham's children, they realized they were obligated to give of their material goods to help provide for them during the famine. And that's simply a, an example of God's grace at work in the hearts of His people. It causes us to have compassion on others and to desire to give to, to meet their needs. <clears throat> now, this morning, we see the church is again persecuted. Herod now moves to arrest some of the believers. He kills one. He imprisons another. But we also see in the midst of this persecution, the Lord protecting His people, executing His justice on the wicked. And we see one of the main reasons why the Lord brings about persecution, and that is to advance His church. That seems to be the result each time the Lord allows this to take place. Now, first of all, we, we see the persecution. Luke tells us that about the same time as the famine that we read about in the last chapter, King Herod arrested some of the believers to mistreat them, which means, you know, he, he scourged them and he imprisoned them. Now, we know there's a lot of Herods in the Bible, and we, we really should talk just a little bit about this one. This is, is not the Herod that persecuted Jesus, tried to kill him when he was basically a toddler. This is Herod Agrippa I, who is the grandson of that particular Herod who did institute that persecution against Christ. Now, this particular Herod was king over Palestine for basically three years, 42, 43, and 44 A.D. Now, this Herod had James, John's brother, also arrested and put to death with the sword. And essentially what that means is, I believe uh, at least A.T. Robertson sees it this way, is that they cut off his head. He was beheaded for the gospel. Now, there's an interesting story that kind of goes on behind this, Eusebius, who was a church historian, who was looking, of course, for um, you know, primary sources. He found a quote by Clement of Alexandria, who was one of the early, what we call apostolic fathers of the church. And Clement of Alexandria said that the Jew who turned James in, you know, that, that basically that betrayal ended in his execution, that that Jew was himself converted to Christianity and when it came time for James to be beheaded, this man was also beheaded at the same time. I think that's interesting. It's interesting, you know, what the Lord uses to bring people to Himself. It's also interesting to see what those who truly know the Lord and love Him and trust Him are willing to do. I think I may have told you this once before, but I knew somebody who, who said, uh, and, and I think we can understand why he said this, but he said, if... If somebody were standing in front of me and said, you know, I'm going to kill you unless you deny Christ, he said, I would deny Christ, and then I would repent later. Well, I think that's what um, we all probably feel like we'd like to do in our flesh in order to preserve our lives, but those who really know the Lord know that the right thing to do is to confess Him, and both James and this man did, and they both paid the ultimate price. Now, this took place early in 44 A.D., and, and think about that. We know when this Herod lived. We know when this execution roughly took place. So right now in the book of Acts, we're looking at about 14 years that have transpired since the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And 14 years later, we begin to see something happening which our Lord told James and John would happen during His ministry. 
Remember, there was an occasion when James and John, with their mother, came to Jesus and they asked for the two places of honor in his kingdom. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said, we're able. And he says, okay, you will drink of that cup, that cup of suffering. And that's what we see beginning to happen here. James, one of those two brothers, is the first apostle, actually the first New Testament believer, to lay down his life for his Lord. And John, as we know, the, the author of the book of Revelation, was likely the last apostle to do so. But they both paid the ultimate price. They drank of the cup of Christ's suffering. And that is something our Lord actually tells us that we must be willing to do if we are to follow him. Now, when Herod saw that this pleased the Jews, that, you know, killing James made them happy, he also had Peter arrested. Luke tells us this took place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is the week just prior to Passover, when all the Jews had gathered together in Jerusalem, and Herod, wanting to basically please the Jews, wanting to gain favor with the Jews, this gave him basically the theater he needed in order to execute or his purposes, I think he fully intended to kill Peter in order to basically bolster his, his um, you know, public opinion regarding himself. Now, one other thing that's pointed out is this, is this event marks the first time that secular power was actually used against the disciples since the Jews handed Jesus over to Pilate for trial and execution. Now, we know things will get more and more heated as the Roman government begins to recognize that Christians are not Jews, they're not a sect of Judaism, which was the only legal religion that was allowed outside of uh, basically emperor worship. As that uh, begins to happen, we see in the book of Hebrews, you know, the authors of the Hebrews encouraging the Christians to hang on to the truth, even though these things are invisible. Don't deny the Lord Jesus Christ, but continue to move forward because if you fall back, you will perish along with the Old Testament system. So this is the first time we see this beginning uh, again now to happen um, since, again, what happened with Jesus. Well, Herod put Peter in prison, and he appointed four squads of soldiers to guard him. You know, the, the word squad essentially means a group of four soldiers, okay? So there's four groups of four soldiers. And these groups would basically guard Peter in shifts, you know, each took a six-hour shift. So at any given time, four soldiers would be watching over him. Two of them would be in the cell with him, essentially chained him on either side. Peter was chained to one on one side, one on the other. And the other two would guard him outside the cell, okay? Um, this was basically the Roman custom. This, uh, you know, this was nothing unusual. Uh, if you don't want a prisoner to escape, you know, chain him to a bunch of other people and make sure you're watching him at every moment. And that's exactly what they were doing. But we understand that this is also what Herod wanted. He wanted to make sure that Peter didn't escape, especially if he was aware of what had happened before. Remember, Peter had already been arrested once with, with the apostles and was released by an angel and when they went into the prison to find them, they were gone, but found that they were in the temple preaching the gospel. Uh, Herod wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. He wanted to hold on to Peter so he could bring him out to the Jews after the Passover was other, over so he could, you know, execute him. Now, Jesus tells us that the world will hate us. Paul tells us that if we live as Jesus calls us to live, we're going to be persecuted. It's inevitable. And as Bible-believing Christians, we also understand that when persecution takes place, that isn't something that happens by accident. It's something that is a part of God's plan. Okay, everything is a part of God's plan. And the question we really need to ask is, why is the Lord allowing persecution after persecution to take place against His church? Well, he allows it for several good reasons. God always has a good reason behind what he does. Now, we've already seen how he used Saul's persecution against the church to kick the Jerusalem believers into high gear. Remember, everybody was content just to stay in Jerusalem. 
the gospel had not been getting out into Judea and to Samaria. So he allows persecution so that they would get busy and begin to get the word out. Remember what we read earlier, those who were dispersed went everywhere, sharing the gospel with as many as they could. So one good reason for persecution is it has the effect of moving the church outward. Secondly, Peter tells us that persecutions, and, and these are the same things essentially as trials, also have the effect of purifying and strengthening our faith. I think they force us to look more to the Lord and less to ourselves, right? When you're going through difficult times, especially when your life is in danger, you tend to spend more time seeking the Lord. I think you tend to spend more time, we all tend to spend more time seeking Him more fervently, and we trust in Him more. I think trials help us also to deal with our sins. You know, when God puts us in the crucible, we begin to see our sins rise to the top, uh, and we begin to repent of those things and pray that God would free us from these things and help us to put them away. I think trials can also help us believe more strongly. I mean, as our faith is purified, it, it has the effect of dispelling doubts. You know, when you're faced with paying a price for your belief in God, you essentially ask the question, do I really believe these things enough to suffer for them? And we have to come to grips with the sin of our doubting. And I think it helps us to do so and to overcome it. And when the Spirit, when by the grace of God, the Spirit of God convinces us even more fully that the things that we are banking our lives on are actually true, it has the effect of pushing us forward with even more zeal, with even more energy. So persecution, even though it's a bad thing in and of itself, is actually something the Lord intends for our good and He works good through it. And with that in mind, we need to bank on the fact that God is actually going to allow persecutions. He's going to allow trials. And when He does, we need to understand what it is He's doing through these trials. The purpose of the trial is not to get us to turn tail and run or to go into the inner room, as it were, and shut the door and hide in the dark, but rather it is to help us deal with the, the sins that we're struggling with and to overcome them so that the kingdom of heaven might move forward in our lives, that we might be strengthened, and that by doing that, the kingdom of heaven might be strengthened in this world by our getting active in, in doing what the Lord calls us to do. You know, with the way things are going in the world today, I think this is something that we need to be aware of because um, Christians are being persecuted for speaking the truth about things that are not popular uh, to speak the truth about. As I said before, very few people want to hear the truth, and they'll only hear it by God's grace. So first, we see the church persecuted. Second, we see the response of the church, which is prayer. Prayer which brings protection and Peter's release. Now, we might look back at what happened to James and ask whether prayer always has this effect. Does it always bring protection? Well, <clears throat> the answer is yes. Even though James lost his life, we need to understand that that was God's answer to prayer. Okay? And James, in losing his life, did not lose anything really of any value but he gained something that was far more valuable. The Bible tells us that the greatest honor in God's kingdom is actually laying down our lives for Him because there is no greater sacrifice than we can possibly make. Jesus talked on one occasion about greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friend. And when we lay down our lives for Jesus, we are giving Him the greatest honor honor. That's what's called, of course, being a martyr. Martyrs do not lose anything, but they gain everything. As a matter of fact, as I've said, they gain the greatest honor which the Lord has to bestow. And no sooner did the sword basically fall on the James' neck than his soul entered into glory, and he began to enjoy the blessings that we all would desire to enjoy. 
You know, um, there was a very famous uh, military general during the Civil War. I think you all know him, Thomas Stonewall Jackson. And he was in the course of the battle, sadly, um, while he was doing some reconnaissance at night, and his, his soldiers were really not in differing places not knowing he was doing this. He ended up being shot by one of his own men, and that shot eventually took his life. And when he was dying, he was told by his wife, that he would soon be with Jesus. He was healing from his wounds, but he had pneumonia. They had no way to treat it. She then asked him after that if he was willing to go and to be with him. And even though it meant that he must leave behind his wife, whom he loved dearly, and their infant daughter, who was born during the war, he, he gave this answer. He said, I prefer it. And that really should be the heart of every believer, to prefer to be with Christ. Remember what Paul wrote in our Scripture reading, to depart and to be with Christ is very much better. And if we really believe that, it'll make a difference in the way we live. General Jackson believed that. That's the reason why he was called Stonewall Jackson, right? Because he knew that if he were to die in the field, if he could, was to be shot by the enemy's you know, rifles, that he would be with his Lord. He also believed in the providence of God that um, nothing was going to happen to him ahead of God's time. And if we would just believe not only that heaven is better, but that we are actually on our way to heaven through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then there's nothing really that I think we would be afraid to do for the Lord. And that's really what the Lord intends, that we be fearless based upon fear, not upon our own strength, but upon His promises. But again, let's recognize James was not the only one who was arrested here. Peter was as well, and the church was praying fervently for him. But the Lord answered their prayer in a different way because the Lord was not yet finished with Peter in this world. On the night before, Herod had planned to bring him before the people. While Peter was sleeping between two soldiers in the cell, by the way, Peter was sleeping, but the soldiers were not supposed to be sleeping. They, they were awake, and I think the assumption is they were awake. And Peter being bound to each of these soldiers by, by a chain that connected their arms together with two additional so soldiers standing guard at the door, an angel appears and lights up the cell, strikes Peter on the side, awakens him, tells him to get up. His chains immediately fall off. And after telling Peter to basically get dressed, put a sandal and cloak on, he let him out of the cell. Peter didn't even really know what was happening. He thought the Lord was giving him some type of vision. But after they had passed the first and second guard and came to the iron gate, which is the gate of the prison, which opening up leads to the city, and after it opens and they go out and the angel directs them down a particular street and the angel leaves, he realizes that these things were actually happening, that the Lord had sent his angel to rescue him. I mean, think about the miracle involved here, the, the soldiers were completely oblivious to the light, to the chains falling off, to Peter leaving the cell. Uh, this was a miracle, a miracle of deliverance, and certainly the Lord can deliver His people. Well, Peter then goes to Mary's house, and this Mary was the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many had gathered to pray. He knocked at the door, was answered by Rhoda, a servant girl. She was overjoyed to hear his voice, but she left him at the front door and basically ran to tell everybody else the good news. And when she told them, they didn't believe her. They thought she had lost her mind, literally that she was crazy. It's the same thing that Festus used the same word later on to talk about Paul when Paul's talking about his experience on the Damascus Road and trying to basically witness to Festus. Festus says, Paul... You're out of your mind. Your great learning is, is driving you crazy. It's the same thing that they said against her. But as she continued to insist, yes, Peter's at the door, they said that it must be his angel. Now, the Jews believe that every member of God's church has a personal guardian angel. I think you've, you've probably heard that before, haven't you? I mean, maybe we even believe we had guardian angels growing up. Now, God does not tell us in His Word that there is a particular angel assigned to us, that we have our own guardian angel. But he does tell us that the angels were created 
in order to minister to those who inherit salvation. So angels do serve us. Angels do minister to us. Angels do guard us. So they were not altogether wrong. And by the way, we should think about that because um, they're invisible, but they are around us, and they do help us, and we need to thank God that, that they do. Okay. Well, Peter continues to knock until they finally open the door, and when they saw him, they were amazed. Peter really is at the door. Now, the Lord tells us that when we pray, that we are to pray in a particular way. We are to pray believing, right? Not to pray doubting. Well, here, you know, we need to ask ourselves, what were they actually expecting, okay? The Lord graciously answers their prayer, but they didn't believe it, even when they saw the answer to that prayer. Okay, so why did that happen? Again, it's our frailty, it's our weakness, isn't it? We just somehow do not believe that God is going to do it, perhaps for us. We know that God can do it. We know He's infinitely powerful. We know that He could do whatever we ask at any time, but I think the problem usually comes with we, we just don't seem to think He's going to do it for us. Well, you know, it may be that this is why the angel directed Peter to this particular prayer meeting. I don't think this was the only prayer meeting going on. I mean, think about how many people there were in the city who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. It said the church, the entire church was praying. I think the angel led Peter to this meeting in order to strengthen their faith and to show them, yes, it really does matter that you pray, that God really will answer your prayers. And they saw that answer, and I think it was very encouraging. Another reason perhaps may be that the Spirit wanted to introduce us to John, who is also called Mark. I mean, I'm not sure if we understand who this person is, but he is the one who is later going to join uh, Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. He's going to be the one who abandons them on that first missionary journey, the one that Paul doesn't want to take on the second missionary journey, but the one who later becomes stronger and more mature to the point where Peter says he is very useful, and eventually the Lord uses him to write one of our Gospels. Okay? He is the author of the Gospel of Mark. So anyway, whatever the reason, Peter describes to them what the Lord had done. He told them to report these things to James, the Lord's brother. Again, the one James, John's brother, has been put to death. This James is the Lord's brother, the one who is the author of the epistle of James. And to tell the brethren, and after that, he leaves. So the point is, when the Lord brings persecution, and really even when he doesn't, it should move us to pray because when we pray, the Lord sends help. Remember what James tells us in James 4, you have not because you ask not, okay? We need to ask if we expect to receive. And when the Lord sends help, we need to recognize that that help is going to come to us in differing forms. Now, we've already seen the help that he gave James, which he allowed James to be executed. That was actually a great blessing. We shouldn't look at that as a curse, okay? It was an honor. Uh, Paul talks about all the different things he went through in his service for the Lord, and he says, from now on, let no one cause me any trouble because I bear in my body the brand marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I have the marks of honor in my own person. I have been beaten, I've been stoned, I've been shipwrecked, I've gone through all of these things, and my body has the scars to show it. That is a badge of honor, not something to be avoided, but something he actually gloried in. And again, the height of that honor and glory is giving your life. So in James, it was different. And with Peter, it was different. The Lord's help is going to be different in different situations, but it will come and it will be exactly what we need. Now, again, remember the way things are going in our society with persecution becoming more and more eminent. We need to pray. But I also want us to pay attention to the kind of prayer the church was lifting up to God, okay? Verse, going back to verse 5, but prayer for Him was being made fervently by the church to God. And I think that's key, fervently. Jonathan Edwards, in his book, Religious Affections, tells us about the kind of religion that is pleasing to God. 
Uh, and that kind of religion is not a, a religion that has an affection, he says, that raises us just a little bit above indifference. I'm not entirely indifferent to the Christian faith, but I'm not on fire. He says the kind of religion that God accepts is the kind that is full of affection and full of zeal. Now, that can be applied to anything, any part of religion, and that also applies to prayer. When we pray, if we don't really want what we're asking, if we're not really, you know, zealously seeking the Lord for it, God's really not going to pay any attention to us. Uh, one of the quotes I think I put in the bulletin this morning was this, where John Bunyan writes, when you pray, rather let your heart be without words than your words without a heart. It's better not to speak, right, and have a heart that is desiring than to speak a lot and not have any desire. Now, that kind of prayer only comes from the Spirit of God. We can't generate it in and of ourselves. We need to be filled with His power, and we know how that comes. It's, again, it's like a virtuous circle. I think we need to pray or begin our prayers with the prayer, Lord, give me Your Spirit so I can pray in the way that I should pray. You know, it was, again, I, the example of, of Luther is a, um, well, I hope an encouragement to all of us when he talked about how he prayed two hours every day uh, seeking the Lord for his blessings. Why did, why did God use Luther so powerfully? He was a, a man of conviction, a man of faith, a man of prayer. And then he said, when I have a lot to do on a given day, I will pray three hours before I begin. Three hours? Three hours? How, how long do we pray? You know, when, we, when we're seeking the Lord, do we give him five minutes, ten minutes? Do we pray for an hour, three hours? Well, what would the Lord do? What could the Lord do through us if we could offer that kind of prayer? Not just length of time, but earnestness, you know, depth of desire. Now, the last thing we, we see, you know, we see the persecution, we see the prayer that brings the protection and so forth, but we also see God's punishment. He executes judgment on the persecutors. Now, the next day, the soldiers were concerned when Peter came up missing, and you bet they were concerned because the soldier who lost his prisoner was told in advance that he would forfeit his life. He would give his life for the prisoners. Now, this wasn't an idea that Herod had. This was basically standard Roman protocol. Remember what's going to happen later in the book of Acts, just really... Uh, four more chapters away, actually only three, in Acts chapter 16, when Paul and uh, Silas are locked up in the Philippian jail and the earthquake takes place and their chains fall off and the doors all fall open and the Philippian jailer comes in with his lamp, lamp and he sees all the doors open. The first thing he does is he grabs his sword and he's about to execute himself, commit suicide, because he knew he was dead. He lost his soldiers. But they were all there, and, and the Lord basically spared him and even saves him, right? Well, these were not going to be saved, okay? They knew what the, you know, what the penalty was. When Herod looked for Peter and couldn't find him, he ordered their execution, okay? They had to be put to death. Now, notice something here. The Lord, in his delivering Peter, essentially condemned these soldiers to death. At the same time that he saved Peter, he was judging the soldiers. And we might think, well, it doesn't sound like the God that I hear about being preached in evangelical churches. Doesn't God love everyone and have a wonderful plan for their lives? Well, he has a wonderful plan for his people, for his elect, but we also know that he's created the wicked for the day of judgment. We know that God judges the wicked every day, and that's what he's doing here. The Bible says that it's only by the mercy of God that anyone is actually living and given time to repent. But that time does come to an end, and God does drop the sword, and He does execute His judgment, as we're reminded, of course, in Romans chapter 1. But we also need to remember that they weren't the only ones who were punished for what was happening here. So was Herod. Luke tells us that Herod went to Caesarea where he became embroiled in a conflict with the people of Tyre and Sidon. 
he apparently had uh, cut off commercial trade with them because he was angry with them. He enacted what we would call today economic sanctions, okay, and it was creating problems for them. It had a severe, a severe impact on their economy. So they came to Herod looking for a way to maybe influence him, and they, they found that way through Blastus, uh, the, uh, the king's chamberlain, which is the person who was in charge of his of his, basically his bedroom. Uh, this person would know Herod and uh, might have some influence with him. And apparently he was able to influence Herod. They came asking for peace. Let's, let's resolve this issue. So Herod decided that he would respond to them publicly. He dressed himself in his royal attire. He sat down on his, judici his judicial bench, basically on this raised platform, and he delivered what Luke calls a, a very eloquent speech. And when the people heard it, they cried out in verse 22, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, what were they doing? We're not quite sure. Were they just trying to butter up uh, Herod because they wanted Herod to, you know, to give them what they wanted? Uh, A.T. Robertson's believes that, that essentially they were enacting emperor worship, you know, Caesar is Lord, this type of thing. Others believe that the Lord had given to Herod on this particular occasion an extraordinary ability to be able to speak. But you know what? God gives us the ability to do everything that we do. And if it had been a good speech or a bad speech, it still would have been God giving him that ability to do that. But either way, Luke tells us, because Herod did not give God the glory, because he didn't credit him for this oration, an angel of the Lord immediately struck him, and he was eaten by worms, and he died. You know, I, I knew the sermon was going to be long, but I had a quote from Josephus. He records this event in his Antiquity of the Jews and talks about how it came in stages as he was speaking. And how over the course of five days, <clears throat> basically, Herod was riddled with, with worms and eaten from the inside out. And how he died a most painful death. Now, that, was, that wasn't the worst of it, was it? I mean, what happened to Herod after he died? Now, the Lord tells us through the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows. This he will also reap. Well, what is it that Herod had sowed? Nothing but evil, right? He had James executed. He arrested Peter and was going to do the same thing to him. He also, by the way, mistreated and arrested several other Christians. He robbed God of his glory. And for this and many other things, the Lord struck him down. You know, we've been looking in the apologetic series. R.C. Sproul is reminding us constantly about Romans 1.18, where Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, I know that the primary sin that is in view here is the fact that they are, they are hiding the knowledge of God and trying to pretend that He doesn't exist. But that's not the only thing that God judges men for. He judges them for all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. And that's exactly what he's doing here with Herod. And that's what he will do with all mankind. And that's why he calls on everyone through the gospel to turn away from their sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that is the only way to escape the judgment that everyone deserves. Okay, there is no one who is innocent. Okay? We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus is the only way to escape judgment. Now, as I've said, that was not the worst thing that happened to Herod. After he died, his soul went down into torment. On the judgment day, he's going to be raised again. He's going to be judged. He's going to be condemned. And he's going to be cast into the eternal fire where he will be tormented in body and soul for the rest of time, which will be forever. It will go on endlessly. And again, if Joseph Bellamy, the uh, disciple of Jonathan Edwards, is correct, if hell is not just a static area where you go in and you suffer at the same level 
that you go in suffering at, if it isn't, if it's actually more dynamic and it's a, more of a, a, a sinking experience into a bottomless pit as judgment becomes more and more severe because the sins that are being committed also in hell are being judged, then things are going to get a lot worse for Herod than just being eaten by worms. Now again, as I describe these things, let's remember, the same thing would have happened to us, but for the grace of God, right? But for the grace of God, there go I. But the Lord sent His Son to live for us and to die for us so that we might be set free from judgment and enjoy going into heaven where, you know, instead of going down for eternity, we're actually going to be ascending for eternity, ascending or, or increasing in our happiness and our joy and our blessedness. Now, that reason, among others, is why we worship the Lord. That's why we serve the Lord. That's why we desire to honor the Lord because God has been so merciful to us. And that's what we need to think about, of course, as we come to the table. Now, just a couple of concluding remarks. Herod is now out of the picture. The persecution, this particular persecution has ended. The door again opens for the expansion of the church, and that's going to lead, of course, to the first missionary journey. Many, James tells us, many more people were saved. And now the Lord brings Paul and Barnabas. Now that this persecution has ended, they can leave Jerusalem where they had earlier gone, remember, to bring the gift of the Gentiles and the Antioch church down to the brethren that were suffering in Jerusalem. Now they're going to go back to Antioch with John Mark, and they're going to be commissioned and sent on the first missionary journey. Now that's what we're going to look at next time. So here we see a great persecution, but we see a lot of fervent prayer, the Lord's deliverance, and the, the end product is the church moves forward, God advances His kingdom through these events, which is, again, why, you know, we, we should expect persecution. It's a part of the way God works. I think really before every great revival, it seems that there is this time of darkness and, you know, uh, well, persecution against the church, difficulty for the church, even you know, even a, uh, I guess you might say, a lackadaisicalness in the church. Uh, uh, you know, fires are burning low. Uh, God sends this to stoke the fire so He can get the church moving again. Well, perhaps we're ripe for that today. We need to pray that if that's the case, that uh, God would send revival and um, renewal and awakening. Well, let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And as we do, let's also prepare to come to the table.